All right. So, Kara, when you said you attached it, uh, where have you attached? I just sent it in an email oh, okay. um, from the Zoom uh, email I sent you before. Got it. Okay. It should be attached there. So I know Swarnov, you were in on that meeting. Um, did you have any um, things that you wanted to discuss with us here? Any thoughts, um, things to like point out and look at? Perhaps his system isn't working. I know, I see that. Give it a second, then I can. I'll text him too. Are Are you guys able to hear me? Oh yeah, now we can. Okay. Well, there we go. <laughs> it turns out that when you unmute on Zoom, it doesn't actually unmute you. Um, but uh, I've shot uh, Mike a email, and uh, hopefully he'll make the town board meeting. Um, but uh, minimally, from the call that we had with him. It seems like by just even joining and adopting the NY stretch, um, if we just want to look at it from a dollar and cents perspective, um, I believe the town receives like five grand for just adopting it, um, which obviously gives us capital to, to use towards obviously moving us forward on the CSC checklist uh, side of things. Um, but in terms of the standards and legislation that uh, we'd probably need to enact as being part of this. Um, Mike in his candid uh, <laughs> conversational tone, uh, which I do love, uh, definitely made it clear that uh, it's the, the only drawback to the NY stretch uh, code being adopted by the town of Yorktown is uh, contractors will have to, to do a little bit of research and reading his words uh, from the conversation we had. But uh, from, from the broad scheme of things, um, in terms of the New York stretch code and such, I don't really have any key questions for him, um, at least the way he presented it and explained everything um, included in the presentation. Things seem rather straightforward and almost like a layup for us to definitely adopt as a town. Um, and I believe Matt agrees, but I'm not gonna speak on his behalf. Um, so with that really being said, uh, it seems like if we had to really oversimplify the benefits of this program is the state will give us a grant uh, in order to help adopt this and uh, at the same time incentivize uh, our town to obviously consider energy efficiency measures across the board. Um, so that's, that's really all I have to say from my side of things. Um, basically, the goal of having him on a call with us uh, today, which uh, unfortunately he's not able to join us, um, was to basically ask any key questions about the broad uh, adoption of the energy code so that we could present it to the town board. He could have custom slides created for us um, so that uh, the town board knows that we've at least given our blessing uh, to move forward with the uh, with the uh, New York stretch goals uh, energy code that they would like uh, enacted for our town. Um, so basically, ideally, even without Mike on the phone, I'd love for us to just kind of quickly pass through, look through the entire document, have an open conversation. Um, and if everyone's aware of the New York stretch code, um, Bob, I know you mentioned you've already read that previously. Um, so if we're all in favor of it, then uh, basically we'll be making our suggestions and any additional questions we'd like Mike to address, we'll send it to him in an email following this and uh, get him to answer that either via email or make sure to include it um, in his presentation to the town board um, in, in the near future. I'm not aware of when that's scheduled just yet. Um, so any questions on that brief little overview? Um, well, I, I, would, 
Yeah, thanks. That's really good, Smarnov. Um, I would say um, I, it's, a, it's certainly better than what we have now. So that's, and it's a step in the right direction. Um, but I would like to see us go further. Um, some, Bob, yes. Perhaps before we talk about the relative merits of the program, for those of us who haven't gone through it, could we um, take a few minutes to all try to get on the same page? I, I think Swarnoff, you said you, you want us to at least go through the materials. Yeah, if we could all look through the actual uh, deck that's there then that'll give a opportunity for us to, to all be on the same page as to what the context and how this entire thing is going to work out. Um, if anyone is able to actually share their screen, then I guess we can do it together um, and try to decipher what Mike would say should he be here. Um, otherwise, we can uh, approach this from a, let's all just independently we'll quickly take a look at it. And maybe in the next two minutes, three minutes, we hop back on the phone and uh, have an active conversation on it. Well, I mean, I paged through it while you were talking in, you know, in two minutes. Cool. But, uh, you know, I don't think I can make a recommendation to adopt this thing based on a two minute <laughs> look at 19 slides. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I, I, I'm not, a, I'm, I'm, I'm calling in on my phone, so I won't be able to share my screen. Uh, so maybe it's productive for, uh, does someone in front of their computer have the ability to, to share the presentation on their screen? I, I think I just gave everyone permission to share. Yeah, I'm still looking for that video that I saw. <laughs> so I give me another minute. I just, it's, I can't remember. I can do it if I have to. Give me a second. All right, I think I was trying to share. Um, let me just, oh, I have to hit the share button. Okay, let's scroll back up to the start. Are you able to see my screen? Yes. Yeah, I can. Okay. So highlights, obviously, right, as Swarnoff said, um, oh, there it is. adopting the code gets us 1,200 points and $5,000 grant. Excuse me, 1,200 points to what? Towards clean energy communities. Well, so, isn't that the whole thing? That's all we needed was 120. That, that's, that's clean climate smart communities. This is clean energy communities. It's a different program, Paul. Oh, okay. Can somebody tell me what CEC is? Then? Well, what? So the, the, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> well, I could take a stab at it. If you, if uh, what I saw is that the clean energy communities program, I think actually may have come out after Climate Smart, but it's like it seems like an overriding uh, program where you can get up to uh, significant grants. I thought it was even a hundred thousand, but it says fifty fifty thousand. Uh, Maybe it's just for this particular thing, but but uh, it's it's really got a lot of money in it. And uh, if you get, I do you remember what it is four four point four of the programs or a certain number of points, you can qualify for significant benefits. It's it's all online. Swan, maybe you can do a better job at that describing this. How many points do you? Yeah. Need? So I I. I I think uh, there, so as part of the CEC program, the number of points we need, we should be able to get it all um, just from the EV charging stations that are going in at Granite Knolls, um, plus the PACE legislation we passed, that will also give us enough points. We had gone over with Carla um, from the state uh, that's been helping us both on the C and CSC side. Um, and is willing to review all our actions. I believe we're going to get the minimum number of points required to get through um, without taking much, any additional actions. How much is that? I I don't uh, I don't know that off the top of my head, <laughs> um, but we do have that documentation. So I will see if I can find it while we're on the phone. 
and, but, and everyone, but the, Mike, Mike is, is on this call now. He just joined us. Oh, good. Um, Mike, how are you? He's muted. Looks like he's muted. Yes, I am here. There he is. Okay. I have a very strange thing happening. I have Microsoft Edge shut down okay. my regular browser and, and it would not let me in your Zoom meeting. Actually, it wouldn't let me connect. And I had to kind of stand on my head here for <laughs> a number of minutes. I'm sorry. That, that, that's why you got to use Chrome and not Microsoft. <laughs> No, no, that's why I that's why I use it. It disappeared from my computer. It was gone. Got it, got it. <laughs> it's very, very bizarre. But stranger things, right? Um, but Mike, uh, so basically, we were all uh, basically independently going through the presentation that you had made to me, Matt. Um, and I'm blanking on uh, the other individual that was John. With us that Andy. day, but John. Yeah. Um, do you want to advance, basically do you want to advance the slides there i i've had it up on my computer i can uh i can sure uh, if you want to console it it might be easier that way for you to walk through it that's fine uh, i'll stop sharing okay and uh yeah mike basically the whole goal is to brief the task force members that are on this call um with what uh, adopting the new york stretch energy code uh code might look like for the town the benefits of it and what's required for the town so that we can ask any questions address any concerns and uh maybe that'll give you some inspiration for slides for the town board when you get the opportunity to present to them and uh hopefully in a you know in no, no time at all we'll be able to to give our vote of confidence for this yeah, that's great. And and again, uh, um, that was a very bizarre <laughs> situation I was in here. My apologies. Um, yeah, and I'm not going to full screen because if we want to jump back and forth between slides, this makes it easier to find them. So can you see my screen okay? This yes. one. Better. Well, cool. So, um, Anyway, so it, it appears as if you have discussed the uh, the standing of the New York stretch in the clean energy communities uh, scope of things, correct? In terms of the you know the award you get for just adopting it, which is no great shakes, but of course the twelve hundred points, in fact, are great shakes. Is Carla on? I'm not seeing her. No, no I, don't I don't believe Carla. Okay. Yeah, Carlos. And, and I need to know. Did you um, did you receive a full clean energy communities briefing, so you know about the uh, you know about the 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 um, yeah. comp competitive round here and and where achieving twelve hundred points uh, falls in the scope of things? Correct. No, I I think my Hello. some members. Some members of the committee are more knowledgeable about the program than others. We don't have a common um, understanding across the five members, I don't think. Okay, well, that's something you really should get from Carla. And I usually she does that first. We're kind of going in in reverse order here a little bit, but that's just fine. We'll get around that. Um, the bottom line is that the uh, the various competitive incentive levels, which are the great shakes in the clean energy community um, program, um, the, the, the adoption of the New York stretch code uh, gets you 1200 points, which is, uh, and, and it would be best if Carla took a look at uh, where you folks are going with regard to your impact items and what you're shooting for uh, in terms of you know where you're trying to get and the incentives you're trying to reach but the long and the short of it is that the adoption of the new york stretch is uh is 
the second highest point getter you can get towards that. And usually in, you know, in, in, it's involved in tens, if not hundreds or a hundred thousand dollars worth of incentives difference by adopting it uh, um, or thereabouts. And again, that's something that Carla can work through for your committee so you can figure out where you're, you're promoting this go and, and what and what the so, folks are Can I ask a question? To. Do you have a template for the legislation that the town board has to enact? There is a template for um, adoption. It's all part of the toolkit, which I'll go over uh, on a, re it's all in a resource page. Uh, so there's a model template uh, regulatory framework that is available as part of the many resources. Thank you. And, and I'll show you where all that stuff is, okay? So generally long and the short of it is you get $5,000 for adopting the New York stretch. No great shakes, but it, 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 it's, it's $5,000. And there's 1,200 points available to the community towards the uh, uh, competitive action grants uh, that are available. So to better understand what the New York stretch code is, uh, again, it's a, a readily adoptable local energy code. It's been in law in the form of Article 11 of the New York State Energy Law, which is actually not quite as old as me. So it's been around for a long time. <laughs> um, I started promoting and supporting the New York State Energy Code in 1979 when it was adopted. At the time, I was a builder. But Ever since then, communities have had the option to adopt a more stringent energy code. And the New York stretch code is now an attempt to make a model code that can be adopted as that advanced energy code statewide. Uh, and, and hence why you folks are considering it and why it's being promoted through clean energy communities. It's going to be promoted through climate smart communities, I am understanding and um, why you're hearing about it here. So the idea of the New York stretch is that it promotes uh, adoption of slightly more stringent energy codes that in this case will roughly match the next baseline New York energy code, uh, which will be adopted in the next two to three years by New York state statewide. Uh, it's not the exact same code, but it's actually um, it's actually equivalent in terms of its energy efficiency. It's based on uh, the 2018 version of the International Energy Code, which New York uses as a base um, to adopt. Uh, the New York Stretch Code is equivalent to the New York, or excuse me, the International. Uh, the 2021 International Energy Code. So the New York stretch itself won't be adopted, but by adopting New York stretch, you'll be preparing for the one that's adopted um, in the next couple of years. It doesn't require any new or fancy or state-of-the-art technology or materials or design or anything like that. It simply you know, utilizes a little bit better of a number of different components and requirements for building buildings. And to understand where it lies here, <clears throat> the, current, the current New York State Energy Code lies right around where the 2018 International Energy Code lies because it's based on it. The 2021 will be here. The current New York stretch that you are considering is equivalent to that 2021 IECC which will be used as the base to adapt either the 2022 or 23 New York State Energy Code, probably 23. By not adopting more advanced energy codes each step, um, you know, the business as usual, we get towards energy efficiency, clean energy, and, and, and climate savings, of course, you know, is on a curve that looks kind of like this with the 
uh, with the more advancing the codes and getting ahead of them by one cycle with the stretch codes, we're more on this sort of a trajectory towards net zero, which is where we want to be with buildings and, of course, clean energy in general. By the way, feel free to throw the anchor out and throw your hands up if you've got questions as we go along, or we can save them to the end, however. Well, it might be a good time to ask a question now, Mike. This is Bob DeAngelis. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Um, I guess what I'm wondering, when I look at the uh, state targets and the new federal targets, this doesn't seem aggressive enough. It looks like we're looking like, oh, 10%, 11% energy savings. We need to go far, much further than that. We have the technology now to easily do 50%, I think. Um, and obviously some people are doing net zero. So wh wh why does this seem to me like it's not pushing hard enough? Well, because if you're concerned about climate change and if you are an advocate of clean energy, of course, nothing we're doing as a baseline is fast enough. But, you know, codes affect, in, in, in the case of energy codes, they affect all buildings and they're mandatory when they're adopted. That's not, you know, warm and fuzzy stuff like incentives for solar PVs or, or, or heat pumps or any of that stuff. You know, that stuff's all voluntary and it's all great to promote that, but it always affects a very small uh, chunk of the market as we go and we get those, those greater leaps in small chunks. Whereas, you know, 10% across the board, 10, 11% across the board for our buildings is a lot of energy savings and it affects a whole market ongoing and we have a lot of market actors to pull along there it's not just the folks who want to do it uh, or, or need the incentives it's the folks that are doing this business day in and day out and it's it's sometimes frustrating i've been like i said uh, in new york state as a builder in 79 to 20 years with the alliance to save energy in washington nationwide and in other countries promoting clean energy in buildings my entire career. And sometimes we just, you know, it's like pushing the noodle uphill, you know, or just plain pushing a noodle. It's not fast enough. But it's it's a big chunk of energy savings when when properly adopted and enforced across all building uh, that's going on in this state and in this country. Is that a good enough answer? It's an answer. <laughs> it's why I have so much gray hair. And yeah. I'm not the one that designed this code, although I've been involved. Actually, I, I designed the first project to adopt our first stretch code <clears throat> originally with New Buildings Institute that, that ended up in this stretch code. So. Is, is anybody in New York doing anything to exceed this? Are they doing districts with, uh, for example, a, a development district where they're pushing for more than this? Anything like that happen? Oh yeah, there's, there's, um, you know, there's been a number of examples, but again, it's a really small, you know, component. And, you know, those people doing those developments, they're not doing because they have to, it's because they've developed a model and they found a niche clientele that want it. And they've educated them. Um, you know, again, we're trying to do the same thing. Uh, the aggregate energy savings in a 11% better um, at, across the state or across your community energy code. But just, I mean, I can't even begin to, to, to enumerate the, 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 the difference that is from those, those little those little projects with large increments as opposed to a large building uh, uh, infrastructure with a small increment you know it's mm -hmm. the savings potential here is huge and yeah there are people doing it and there are some of those projects that have taken the time to show compliance with the New York stretch to say hey we just changed our model a little bit and this model works and the costs, you know, pay back in 
10 years or 20 years or in the first month where, where most of this pays back, most clean energy, most energy efficiency pays back in the first month of a 30 year mortgage. So, you know, can you, again. Can you tell us the names of communities that are doing what you just said? Um, <clears throat> well, there's not com whole communities that are doing it. There are communities who are adopting the New York stretch. The, the, in terms of building programs that are uh, beyond, um, uh, you know, far beyond the, the, the base energy code. Uh, I'm trying to think what uh, Boniello construction down there has done a number of, um, uh, has done a number, I'm trying to remember uh, their name, has done a number of projects that are near net zero. Uh, there's a number of them up here in the capital region uh, that they've done near net zero, but it's a, it's a handful. And there are great leaders and great bell cows, if you will, for the rest of the, the building community. Um, but they impact a very, very small market. And that's not, I'm not trying to discourage that. I, the only homes I ever built back in the seventies were high performance buildings that are way beyond um, this code here in 79. But I mean, one, of, one of the reasons we're so interested in this, Mike, is that we have now, Yorktown's been pretty stagnant in terms of building since I've been here, and that's a long time, tw over, 20, over 20 years, 30, almost 40 years probably. But we have significant development being proposed right now. And yep. a, lot, a lot of us want to make sure we do it right. There'll be literally hundreds and hundreds of units uh, built dwelling units. And, and it seems they're going to be here for the next, as you know, 50 to 100. Well, the way we build things in the United States, I'd say 50 years, but they should be here for 100 years. And it, it we would love to see it go further. And I, I don't want to belabor the point. You, uh, you're doing a great job. But I just, uh, since we have this one-time opportunity, I think we want to do the stretch. I, I'm interested in the stretch goal. We should adopt it. But I would love to see a district approach also overlay that and say, look, for these development districts, let's do even more. Yeah, um, you know, there may be something you could promote. Um, you know, I'll tell you an organization that might be interested in promoting such an approach. And again, this is not something you're going to put together in the next two weeks and, and propose countywide. But uh, Sustainable Westchester is very, very active and is not afraid to uh, discuss and possibly take on those kinds of approaches. Uh, if you want to uh, email me afterwards, uh, I could perhaps connect you and whoever else might want to talk about a longer term, even greater step. And, and that may be something you know, that you do for the next go round, because there will be for the next code adoption cycle in 23, there will be another um, how many percentage points New York stretch code and an opportunity to do this again. Now, I will tell you that one of the reasons that this model code, this model stretch code is being adopted is, you know, there are laws around what you can adopt for building codes in New York state. You can't just do it in your community and get away with it. <laughs> you have to file with the Department of State. And if you go any different <coughs> than the New York stretch code um, uh, in areas that it doesn't cover and have been reviewed by the Department of State, you have to go through this other process called the more restrictive local standard, MRLS process, where the entire code Council has to vote on your community's uh, proposed uh, code adoption. If you have more stringent laws, and this goes on in many communities, not necessarily for energy, but for other things uh, all over the place. Some some green building stuff, some you know special needs and handicapped uh, housing needs and what have you. But anyway. Let me let me continue this here, and we'll see. But I'd be glad to to uh, 
get you connected and, and pointed in the right direction if you want to go higher. We'll talk about communities that have adopted this code that you might want to talk to right not far away, uh, town of Bedford. I don't know if you know Mark Teal King and the folks in Bedford, uh, but they're real leaders. They've had an advanced code uh, in New York State because of this rule, not the New York stretch, but a previous uh, Energy Star Homes program was their residential code that they adopt because of Article 11. So let's push along here. Um, so lots of benefits for doing this. Obvious, the obvious climate regions that, uh, that all of us are hoping for, um, you know, having a, a greater impact on but uh, to be perfectly honest with you, I never pitch it for climate reasons or climate mitigation reasons. I think the economic reasons all by themselves are, are, are plenty. And quite frankly, it rings much more true with Joe electrician and the building community and what have you. If you can't make the economic case, you know, relatively near term, they don't wanna hear it. And they don't know from climate change. It doesn't resonate with a lot of the folks we need to hit. I'm a believer, don't kill a messenger here, but we need to make this work for all the stakeholders, the builders and what have you. So a lot of, uh, a lot of impacts that are really important, those are the particularly the, the, the economic impacts of energy efficiency that dozens of organizations, most notably the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy have been promoting that, you know, the money you save on energy efficiency in your community stays in your community. Not, not as much as when, you know, petroleum products were, you know, ex imported from far and wide, uh, but just because of the dollars that are expended here and saved here and re reinvested. So, uh, and it comprehensively approach, you know, deals with those issues in buildings. We have a lot of buildings that uh, you may not know this, but the energy code and this New York stretch advanced code um, impacts existing buildings. You know, the real bang for our buck is not a new construction. It's in the existing buildings being renovated. There are far in a way more building permits today. I'll bet, I'll bet, I'll bet my English Springer Spaniel here, um, who's watching us intently, um, that you know the energy savings in your existing buildings, and not only uh, because uh, a lot of them are are, are not uh, very efficient at all, but because. It's, it's by far and away the largest activity in your code office is renovations, work on existing buildings. Those people renovating Main Street or uh, you know, uh, taking up uh, old commercial buildings that we've long wanted someone to do something with. You know? So it's a big deal. It's a, it's a lot of savings. Um, and you know, there's a lot of workforce development going on around that um, to, to help uh, develop the, the, the uh, professionals that do that work, that do the design, you know, and it's 40% of our total energy use on an average nationwide. Uh, and there's a lot of ways you can help stakeholders uh, finance that as well, uh, again, in the community. I don't know, did you folks, have you folks adopted CPACE financing? Yes. Okay, um, I thought I had heard that. So that's another way. I mean, a lot of communities have adopted CPACE financing, but a lot of those same communities have done nothing with it. You know, you get a big developer coming in, building a bunch of units that are gonna be meeting the energy, the New York stretch energy code, and or above, um, those are projects you could bring in the door for uh, the CPACE financing, just as an example. As far as the, the near-term economic benefits, um, uh, NYSERDA spent a great deal of resources conducting 
um, the statewide uh, uh, cost benefit analysis for commercial construction, and this is just new construction and, and calculated very, very conservatively and not taking advantage any of the utility and NYSERDA and other incentives that are available. Um, you know, savings was more like around 7%, uh, incremental costs only about a dollar a square foot and a payback around 10 years. Um, if you look at the, um, uh, if you look at uh, the commercial savings in climate zone four, which Yorktown is in, uh, here you see, I mean, you can see the difference in, um, in how much uh, by percentage the construction in this region is commercial. Uh, cost savings are a little bit lower. And, and again, this is by climate zone, again, conservatively and not taking advantage of any of the incentives, which can buy this payback and the first cost way down. Uh, likewise, on the residential side, we're finding statewide a range of say $1,500 to $2,100 multifamily and single family construction, new construction again, with paybacks of just under 10 years and a little over five years for multifamily and single family. Uh, again, no incentives. And, and again, when you look at it by climate zone four, where Yorktown is, uh, that 10 year figure keeps coming up 1400 to 2400 this, uh, this, in this case. So there's an extensive cost benefit analysis, which I'll show you how to get to. Um, and, and, and it's really important that you think about and help uh, as and if you adopt New York stretch, you know, helping the construction stakeholders see this. There's builders leaving thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars in incentives on the table because they're so caught up with building homes right now. And God forbid anybody comes to you and say, oh, this is going to drive my costs for construction way up, and it's going to it's going to push me out. I'm going to go build over in you know Bedford Hills or somewhere else. That is an utter nonsense. You know that's a that's a something you hear all the time from your code official and from your supervisor. Oh, you know Joe the developer will take his business elsewhere. Baloney! I have never in 40 years of supporting the energy code ever seen that actually, ever seen a real case of that happening. It just doesn't. It's another, it's another thing that unfortunately builders and developers do because they hate regulation. So you're going to hear that at some point. And I'm here to help you deal with that. I'll arm wrestle them for it. <laughs> but, but truly, you will hear that somewhere along the line. Or your code official may say, Oh, the builders are going to cry about cost. Oh, with construction materials up, these costs that we looked at here, $1,400, $2,400, 85 cents a square foot, that's a drop in the bucket. I mean, they're, they're building so much and so fast right now. Uh, those costs make little difference as to what goes on right now. They're more, more worried with availability of basic construction materials like lumber and such. Um, there's, there's the same performance path that's, that's required or allowed for the base energy code, the one that we're adopting, that we are already adopting and implementing that they're being, uh, that's being enforced in Yorktown today, uh, the prescriptive, the performance, the passive health, path is, is the only new one uh, that we've got now uh, because it's so popular in, the, in New York and the Hudson Valley. Uh, that's one way they can go. Now you were asking before about people doing better. Well, pa Passive House not only uses the New York stretch code as its uh, baseline when you adopt it, but goes beyond that with green building uh, requirements and and other more efficient requirements 
uh, that are not part of the code. So that's one thing that's been accommodated to do even better yet, if you want it. That's not a bad standard. And then there's the ERI path, which many communities in the Hudson Valley uh, adopted under a different name, um, Energy Star Homes. It's the same rating system uh, that's used for the New York, it's used in the, the base New York code. You have to get a, a rating of 62. In the New York stretch, it's 50. It's quite a bit better. As far as it creating more work, code officials do worry. Oh my God, I, you know, I'm buried already. Uh, this is going to create so much more work. Well, most code officials, if, if they're taking advantage of what's available for them to make energy code enforcement easy, um, they have the same tool in place because NYSERDA has also created what's known as the ResCheck and the ComCheck software packages, which were developed uh, and are developed and maintained by the New York or the US Department of Energy. All they have to do is have the designer, the builder, uh, complete this software, which is free, and show that the building complies. As you see, one selection here is the 2020 New York stretch. So compliance and enforcement are the same. There's no difference. They don't have to do anything different, the code officials. Uh, it's all the same enforcement mechanism because it's just an overlay of the base code. Uh, and you know, ask for these reports, which oftentimes is, is all the code official <clears throat> has time to collect and use for a plan review. So all those tools are there and available for them. So you know, it, there is on the resource site, which I again promise I'll show to you, um, uh, there's, there's a comparison document which actually looks into the nitty gritty of what's different between the, the baseline New York State code, which you're enforcing now, and the New York stretch code. And generally speaking, for both commercial and residential types of new construction, there's a little bit more insulation required. Uh, there's, there's better lighting and electrical, which as I'm sure you know, uh, already, I mean, if you're not taking advantage of the utilities, cheap or free lighting efficiency incentives as a homeowner or as a business, uh, you're in the wrong business <laughs> uh, because they'll just about give that stuff away and design work as well. One of the differences that gets misinterpreted a lot is this EV and solar PV readiness requirement. Some think that, oh, we got to put PVs on the house or, you know, we got to put charging stations for electric vehicles on our, our new office building. No, all you have to do is reduce the soft costs by making sure that your electrical panel has extra space to accommodate this stuff down the road uh, when the building owners want to add it, PVs or electric vehicle charging. And that, that goes a long way towards seeing those technologies, those higher technologies adopted because it lowers those soft costs. Pretty much the same uh, for residential. There are better requirements both sides, but especially on, uh, on the residential side, side, not so much for your climate zone, but for a little bit better uh, and balanced ventilation, which of course is important during the time of COVID. Mike, I have a question if I can again. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with the solar readiness, and this is something I know Paul would have asked anyway, uh, I can tell you right now, there's two very large homes that I'm aware of being built in Yorktown. And it makes me sick to see them because they're, they've oriented the roofs so that it's almost impossible to ever put solar panels on the roof. They either have dormers or they, they're, you know, the, the gable end of the roof is facing south. There's almost no south facing windows on these homes. And there's just simple basic design things that, that ought to be included. Um, is there any requirement for how the roof is oriented so that it could facilitate solar installation at a later date? There is no 
requirement that you orient the building, but there is a requirement that if the building is oriented, in other words, to put it in simple terms, you can't get away with not making your roof ready if the orientation is, is correct. So just as we don't have designers that lay homes out and design homes out to accommodate, to better accommodate solar, um, we don't have we don't have designers that accommodate the, the possibility down the road. And that's where this uh, solar and EV readiness thing come in, especially on the solar side, that if you have, uh, your designer has to check to make sure that if your uh, if your home is oriented such that it could take advantage, that you do some roof load calculations to make sure that not only when it holds the snow, uh, can it hold the uh, a PV array if it's so oriented. Um, you know, maybe the next, maybe the next will. But you got you know, solar orientation is a pretty wild thing. I mean. How many developers that do you know or have heard of? I, I you know, I know a, a few, but and I was fortunate that uh, when I got into home building, I was a subcontractor for a designer that only oriented his neighborhoods for solar. But that's not an easy thing to do, and you know, Mother Nature and the topography don't always lend itself to solar exposure. Uh, too often it, they, it lends itself to the nice view of the lake or the valley, which is on the north side of the house, right? <laughs> I guess I, I agree with you, but I would say that in many cases, it wouldn't be that hard to do better, you know, yeah. and, and they'll put, I could, you know, we could take a walk, I could show you these houses and you'd go, boy, they could have made it so much easier. Uh, and it wouldn't yeah. have affected the, it wouldn't even affected the orientation of the house, just the roof line. So, so anyway, I don't want to belabor the point, but I, I would love to see that come out in a future uh, edition of this. Yeah, well, uh, another thing that I can send you, if you just shoot me an email reminding me about that and about uh, other future issues, I'll put you on a, a, on a, um, a listing for an RFQL. It's a, it's a request for qualifications if you want to influence the next New York stretch code, um, they'll pay you for your, your opinion. So I highly encourage you and any of you there, uh, take a look at this thing and maybe one of you join, you know, submit to this thing and, uh, and, and join the development of the next, um, uh, the next stretch code. That sounds really interesting. Thanks. Yep. Remind me in an email, though. I will. I, I have will. that CRS syndrome that us old people often get. <laughs> that's, that's why I'm writing notes down on my pad. CRS syndrome. Okay. Can't remember things. Stuff. Stuff. Can't remember stuff. <laughs> We're in mixed company here. So another thing we hear is, oh, no, that you know, I want to come in and renovate the Muskowitz block in, in Yorktown. And it's these beautiful old buildings. And uh, this is going to send my cost to do that right through the roof. And I'm not going to do it, Paul. You know, we'll go somewhere else and do their building. Again, nonsense. Um, the, the same things that enforcing the baseline energy code requires of those building renovations is required in the New York stretch code. So for example, if you go to replace, you got windows that are just, you can't live with them anymore. Not only are they beat up and ugly and falling apart, but they leak like a sieve. And so we want to replace them. Does that mean we have to upgrade the whole building to the energy code? No. All you have to do is whatever the new work is that you're doing, you got to fix that, okay? So the windows would have to comply. And that's relatively easy. Window industry is way ahead of the codes, generally speaking. Uh, another thing we get seen, uh, we see being done with commercial buildings is they, um, is they make one story combined commercial residential where like say the first story will be uh, small storefronts that they 
uh, have tenants for, and then the upper floors are residential because th there's a huge push for uh, multifamily residential everywhere in New York State right now. Um, so again, you know, if they redid the facade on the first floor, well, does that whole first floor or the whole building have to meet the energy code? No, it's just what you're replacing or they got to put a new roof on. Um, do we have to do we do we have to replace all the insulation in the whole building? No, just probably just the insulation that's under the roof covering on the top deck of that of that flat or shed roof on that commercial building. So it's all the same as the way it's been working. Uh, I took a look at a, a commercial renovation, a roofer contractor. He uh, at Bedford Hills. He was like all contractors do. I know I was one, um, uh, although I didn't whine about this stuff. Uh, <laughs> he was all upset because he was afraid that his, his re-roofing costs would go way up and he'd have to start charging more and lose business. Uh, a flat roof he was looking at uh, to replace the roofing in the, in the damaged uh, board insulation underneath it on the deck uh, would have to be replaced to R30 under the base code. The, R, the stretch code only required another R3. Well, he all of a sudden calmed way down and said, well, heck, I wouldn't even figure that small increment into my cost. <laughs> I mean, he could add it with essentially no additional cost to him. So it's not that big a deal. Now you could amend your local New York stretch code. However, if you make it weaker, you don't get the clean energy community points. That makes sense, right? There were a couple communities that looked at uh, maybe just adopting it for residential, uh, for example. And when they saw that they weren't getting those 1200 points, they said, I don't think so. Um, so they adapted it across the board. Again, in your neighborhood, Bedford's a good place if you know any of the folks over there, or if you know um, uh, Mark Teal King, who's their uh, sustainability director, I believe. So you can make some changes. If you make it more restrictive, you probably have to go through the more restrictive local standard process, which is a real, with the Department of State, which is a real pain in the neck and why they're making it harder to do better makes absolutely no sense to me that, but you know, uh, there's a lot of things that don't make sense, right? And you know, because if you adopt this New York stretch as it is, the, the mandatory filing with the Department of State just for the Article 11 stretch code is just a, it's just a, a little paper push. And there's lots of training and resources available too. There are some requirements for third-party inspections and verifications. That is not changing uh, either, except in the case of commercial um, air barriers. We've created um, a whole generation of leaky commercial buildings because way back in the, in the day, the, uh, the engineers and the purveyors of heating, ventilating, and air conditioning equipment said, I ah, don't worry about the envelope on your commercial buildings. Don't worry about the windows or any of that stuff. We'll make it all up with your with more efficient heating and air conditioning equipment. Well, there came a time when you could only squeeze so much energy out of this metal box. And, and what we have is, you know, we've kind of reached the peak as to where we can go with some of that efficiency and created a bunch of leaky buildings. So in the new construction, it makes lots of sense to make those buildings much more airtight and what have you, and to commission uh, those, uh, those uh, uh, air barriers and in many cases, test them. Just like for residential building, we do blower door tests. I don't know if any of you have heard of that, but all new homes have to be blower door tests. It took us years to get that in the code. Um, but we finally got it done. And it's, it's a huge, it makes a huge difference, not just for energy efficiency, but for comfort and for health reasons as well. You don't want a bunch of air coming in 
or going out to where you don't know it's where it's coming from or going to. It's a, uh, it's bad juju. <laughs> it's bad. It's bad to bring in air from let, let it leak in from somewhere that you can't control because you don't know what's coming with it. So resources, and this is where all this stuff hangs out. Uh, the the uh, NYSERDA. Uh, newyork.gov and and you've got this presentation obviously so you have this link go and look at this stuff I guarantee that you know uh, I mean it's it's really good stuff there's a resource guide first of all you have me as long as and, and until you adopt and shortly thereafter uh, the circuit riders which I am serving as for Westchester County and then two other whole regions, all of the capital region, all of the North country. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm here to help you wherever you need help, technical assistance, advocacy ath assistance, um, presenting to your board, uh, testifying uh, at uh, any hearings. <clears throat> uh, I'll work with your code enforcement people. I have a little uh, kind of a special presentation to get them one step more uh, technical look at the at the New York stretch code itself than you're getting here, um, which is what they need to understand it and not be afraid of it. Because again, all code officials, they're going to ask, is this going to make more work for me? And is it going to create greater cost to the builders and the homeowners that they're going to yell at me for? Because they're the ones that hear it first. There's an adoption guide and model local law. Uh, Paul, you were asking about this earlier. It's yes. all there for moder minor modification that you can use to adopt for your community. Uh, there's uh, right now there's training online that's available uh, and a bunch of uh, code enforcement tools and checklists that are coming. The most important thing for your code official that they will absolutely love to hear is since the New York stretch is just an overlay of the existing energy code, uh, NYSERDA has paid for and will be getting code books, uh, a number of hard copy, but also available online that are where the stretch code is laid right into the base code. The code officials love that. They hate having to look at 10, 12 different codes all the time. And so often they have to do that. Uh, so. Uh, they're going to like hearing that. And that's that's due out, I heard, sometime end of this month. There's the New York stretch versions of ResCheck and ComCheck, that software I told you about. That's free. It's web-based. Uh, costs nothing. There's a hotline uh, for technical and interpretation assistance. And, and I can do a bunch of that for you. Um, and again, you know, the, one of the big reasons to adopt the code, the New York stretch as is, is all those resources <clears throat> are designed to, uh, for that, that model New York stretch code. Right now, uh, latest adoption, there's probably another dozen communities down your way in process and the same up in the capital region. Uh, the, the North Country is lagging way behind, and in the rest of the state, they're doing better, but I don't know because I'm not working there uh, as much. But the city of New Rochelle just adopted, and I know there's a new, uh, there's a, a new initiative to get the rest of the cities, including Rye and White Plains, et cetera, et cetera, Yonkers to adopt as well. So... New Rochelle, Bedford, town of Bedford, uh, Hastings on Hudson was uh, one of the first. City of Beacon was, was uh, the first. Montour Falls, which is over in Western New York. Dobbs Ferry, they've all adopted. And again, there's another dozen in your region and in Westchester that are thinking about it. So we have time for questions now. These are all the people you need uh, to know how to get a hold of if you want. Carla Castillo, who you have no doubt heard from and worked for or with. Um, you know, if you're going down the CEC path, it'd be good to have her analyze what you're thinking about and 
help you put together a package of what you're going to go after, including the New York stretch, of course. Because, you know, you don't want to be rid of me so soon. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, and then these are my contact information as well. And I, I really, I can't encourage you to, you know, do not hesitate. You'll leave here tonight, no doubt, thinking, oh, damn it. I forgot to ask DeWine this. Or, Robert, you said, but what about if we also include such and such? <laughs> Don't hesitate, please don't hesitate to pick up the phone. Call me anytime if I'm not right here. I'll, um, I'll get back to you toot sweet and work with you on any questions you have and I'll, I'll show and create any more presentations you want for any others of your stakeholder groups, including your code official, which uh, I'm sure will have questions and wanna know what's going on. I don't know if you've talked to uh, to him or she, I don't remember who the code official is there these days. But I've been doing training for energy codes for well, since 1986 officially. So most of them know me. So any more questions? And I'm, I'm here as long as you want me. So uh, just to uh, level set, sworn off, um... And Bob, you had you participated in a meeting already with John Landy? No? Not me. I, I did. A... I did, yes. Okay, so sworn off, it was you, Matt, and John Landy? Correct. Okay. And um, so what were the next steps and what how was that received by John uh, in your opinion? Uh, in my opinion, is everyone on the call, including John, uh, was positive in it, and we all want to take it to the full town board uh, to get their approval here. So mm -hmm. John included. Yep. Yeah, uh, and I think. Oh, that's um, right. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Great. And so I think for the for the um, purpose of the town board presentation. Um, it would probably make sense to, prior to that, have had a more in-depth uh, review, maybe with the, uh, you know, I don't know if it's the, the code enforcement people, the, the um, you know, the planning board, whatever, um, have, a, have a deep dive with them, get their buy-in as well, and then the presentation to the town board could be a fairly high level. Right, because usually at a, you know, at a work session or whatever, you know, there's a certain amount of time that, you know, these things got, the one I was on right. last night went on for a lo really long time. We were an hour behind schedule by the time my agenda item came up. So. Right. Just, just John, and I apologize. It's part of that CRS syndrome business. I had forgotten about John Landy, uh, attending uh, that meeting, he was very supportive. And um, oftentimes that's all your administration needs to hear is that, hey, this isn't going to create more work and or be more expensive in your mind's eye. Yeah, that's kind of my point. If, <clears throat> yeah. you know, the town board members don't need to get into the weeds, um, if they hear that all the people that are going to be impacted uh, either to administer or whatever, um, you know, have kind of um, bought into this and, 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 and can recommend it just as we can recommend it as the CSC committee, uh, then maybe, you know, uh, we can keep it a little more <laughs> high level for the town board. Absolutely. As Absolutely. long as they know the key things, the key points, I think they, that are important to them is it's not going to cost us any money. It's not going to drive business away and development out of our town uh, and make us appear to be, you know, uh, um, putting up obstacles. Um, I, I mean, I think those are the key points, right? Paul, Bob. Uh, well, I mean, one thing I'm, I, I know you're not going to probably have an answer for it, Michael, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Sure. It just seems like this should have just been the code. 
instead of making all this work for each town to review it and think about it and decide whether we want to adopt it. Do you have any insight as to why they didn't just say, here's your new energy, here's your new building code for the state? Well, because there's other people than us believers hmm. involved. And I will tell you that again, in I mean, I was a builder. I am a I'm a member of three New York State Builder Association chapters. I'm a consultant to builders. And I've been working with, you know, builders associations across the, sun, the country and the National Association of Home Builders uh, on codes. And that it's way too often like this. And it's because they don't like regulation. They just feel that, oh, we ought to just let them build homes because they know how. And Get out of their hair. And, and we know, of course, that without some kind of quality control over the whole thing, some basic requirements, and that's all this is. It's the worst, you know, the, the base energy code is the worst you can do by law. And they complain about that. They complain about all the codes. They don't like regu regulation. They're very conservative and think that things should always just be the same. And that they shouldn't have to keep up with that. Um, I look at that's it. That's right. We've got a lot of people. I was going to say one, one way I look at it is when you build a really energy efficient home, which we have, I have a friend that has one, uh, you don't enslave them for the next hundred years to buy oil and gas to heat it every single winter. You're freeing yeah. them, you're freeing them from utility bills for the rest of their lives. So, so. Um, if, you know, I guess my view of freedom is, is that, <laughs> and I think you, people th need to think in the long term and not think about, well, the builder during this year will expend these dollars. I like to think about, well, what about the cost of that building for the next hundred years and its environmental impact? And I, I know I'm <laughs> preaching to the choir, but, but that's the way I look at it. And so without a doubt, we should approve this, I believe strongly. And I think in any case, we can do better if we have the opportunity to do something. I know they're looking at LEED certification as an option for people in those new developments, um, but they're giving them some, I think, benefits on parking and such. If, if, if you do the LEED, that's, that's a step in the right direction. It looks like this saves us about 10, you have, I think, 11% or thereabouts from the current building code. Um, right. lead, I, I looked at the lead website, looks like they're about 30%. And I, I think we can do far better. What do you have any views on the lead? Well, actually, it depends on what you're talking about. If you're talking about just the energy side, which is the primary climate mitigation side, um, we're, we're looking more at, um, uh, well, for the residential side, they're, they're, uh, the, the, uh, the actual energy requirements aren't a whole lot better than uh, our base energy code. For the commercial requirements, it's actually worse for LEED than our base energy code. It's because LEED hasn't caught up to the current code cycle for commercial building. So there, yes, there's a lot of other green building requirements that are that are much more stringent, but green doesn't necessarily save you energy. Okay, and so uh, there's a lot a lot more you can do. I was just trying to find a picture or something, but I can't because it's it's just not falling to hand. It's fighting me like your Zoom connection was earlier. Um, <clears throat> but uh, long story short. Um, you know, this is a nice step forward. I hope you you do take a shot at it. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the uh, and I'm and I'm here to help you. Um, let me show you something quick. I'm going to take this screen back again. So you see this gnarly old guy or young guy. Uh, with the mountains in the background here. This is me building a, a high performance home back in the day. Uh, and I built in the North Country, by the way, in heating degree day zone of 
seven to almost 10,000 heating degree days, much colder than most of the rest of the state, as you probably know. Um, and these, these were the kinds of homes, the only kind of home that, that, uh, that I built, okay? Uh, the, 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 the builder that I first uh, contracted as a subcontractor for masonry work, like you see down here, this is the masonry guts of this house here. Uh, this house is on the side of Upper Saranac Lake. It's in 9,000 and some odd heating degree days. Uh, you're looking at the south face. It uses what's known as optimum value engineered framing, uh, where you don't put any more lumber in the walls than you have to. Uh, two by four, because that's all you really need. Uh, and like walls that are like R30 and super air sealed. Um, we put in a, a very simple storage system that you can't see that's basically masonry concrete block underneath the whole slab floor. This house was, was slab on grade, none of the silly tubes and rocks business that's so expensive, just concrete blocks tipped on their side to make like a manifold. Long story short, 4,100 square foot house, which isn't huge by today's standards, but um, Outside of the property and the civil costs, the, the basic cost of this hot, super insulated home, we used to call it, um, was about $150,000 over the same size traditional home. And everybody on the planet and in Saranac Lake and around the neighborhood um, made fun of this guy because he spent that much money on energy efficient, you know, on an energy efficient home. Well, it took 10 years to burn the, the, the firewood from the, um, uh, the trees that were cut down to open up this site. We put in electric heat because the bank requires some kind of conventional heat by code, but the circuit breakers were never put in. Uh, he could walk away from this house in the dead of February and not drain the water down. And this house would stay warm a face cord of wood um, uh, in this small wood stove that was circulated through this and then the solar hitting that surface and also being drawn into an air handler was the only heat in this building in Upper Saranac Lake. And this is 1979, okay? It's the year before the Olympics in Lake Placid. So this isn't rocket science. And yes, we could do a whole lot better but this is one, I mean, the, the two other uh, carpenter contractors that worked on this, all they did was complain about it the whole time they built it. Uh, 140, 149 something, $150,000 different. Uh, this guy who is a longtime friend of mine and my, was my uh, internal doctor in Saranac Lake, put it on the market for, for $1.2 million four years ago to sell it and sold for um, about one, just a little over $1 million. So you think in 20 some odd years, 25 years, he did okay on that 149,000 investment. Uh, there's no question, we all know that, but try to tell a conventional builder that, that would have built that house for, you know, $110,000. Uh, outside of civil works and well and stuff like that. Um, so anyway, I'm with you and it's a pleasure to be working with you folks who are thinking ahead of the game here. And um, I mean that, and, and that's why I, again, don't hesitate to call with any other questions or you need to, you know, somebody come in and arm wrestle the developers, I'll do it. And it's a pleasure to, to work for you on this stuff. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Yep, my pleasure. Shall now we, I have uh, to go take my dog out before she really gets angry with me. Yeah, I was going to say we should let Mike go and so we can wrap up on any other topics that we need. Thanks to much. Cover. I will definitely be in touch with you offline. All right. You, again, wide open. You, you just, uh, my time is your time. I mean that. Take care, thank everybody. You, have a great night and be well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> so much for our two or three minute review, Swornoff. Oh, it was time. It was time. Yeah, that was uh, <laughs> um, that, that was a uh, a presentation. Um, but at but least I now, think, I think we all at least. Uh, Paul, you're comfortable. You know what we're talking about now. <laughs> That's the wrong question. The question is, am I in favor of the stretch being adopted by Yorktown? The answer is yes. Yes. Perfect. We good unanimous on that? Yes. yes. Cool. Well, we will let Matt note that uh, he's uh, that uh, he can push this forward to the town board and uh, get the involved stakeholders ready beforehand. Um, other than that, uh, I guess I will keep it brief um, so that we can all get dinner or do whatever ever else we have um, for our evenings. But uh, basically, in terms of CSC. Um, we have to get the priority actions uh, sorted away pretty ASAP. Um, so I'll be working with uh, Robin and Kira on uh, the other sides of things. Um, Bob will be taking the lead on the inventory that he's been doing. Um, he does need a little bit of information, I believe. Um, but uh, he said when he gets back uh, from his break on the 25th, he'll be able to take a look into uh, getting this all into the Energy Star Portfolio Manager that Carla uh, mentioned we need to do. Um, yeah. So pretty much simple, straightforward. At this point, it's, uh, it's a brute force. We just got to get the application in and uh, get the town uh, bronze certification and then enjoy a bottle of champagne, all of us together, um, <laughs> given everyone we're all vaccinated at that point. But um, so that's uh, basically it on the CSC side of things uh, as it relates to the CEC side of things, which Mike was uh, mentioning on the call. Carla did give us a presentation and bring up um, where we stand. As I mentioned uh, earlier on in the call, um, we should be able to get the certification for that. I believe she sent us information and an email regarding that. Um, so at this point in time, uh, I will look for that email and I will forward it over to you guys um, as it relates to the CEC. But uh, it seems like we are on pace on that front as well. Um, and of course, from a EV charger standpoint, uh, Sarah was, of course, there. Um, I don't know if any of you guys had a chance to watch the recording. Um, uh, of the town or the session that happened last night. Um, but basically, Flow uh, has been proposing EV chargers. And... <laughs> um, but uh, basically, uh, from an EV charger standpoint, it seems like the uh, town will be able to get electric vehicle chargers potentially entirely for free. Um, this is not a guaranteed thing yet, um, but it does seem like uh, we've gotten town board approval to go ahead and apply for the grants. Um, and that would be a huge win for us as a town um, to start to see some EV charging infrastructure pop up, uh, not to mention it will get us yet another priority action, moving us even closer to you now silver uh, certification at a CSC level. So. With that being said, it's uh, you know basically a grab and run at this point, and uh, we're nearing the end of the finish line for bronze. And uh, as soon as we get that passed, uh, it's going to be a rat race for us to get to silver. Um, but uh, I have no other updates from my side, um, unless anyone else has anything to mention. I would say that um, we, we, I think we should continue to fo focus on education outreach to the town. I know oh, we did a couple of things right away, but if, if somebody's willing to schedule it and work with me, I'm more than glad to give a presentation on, uh, you know, sustainable home heating and air conditioning. I, I've given it a few times and it goes over pretty well. So. Awesome. Um, make that offer. Hey, and, let's, I think Bob, that's a win. Um, you know, Matt had offered um, if we wanted to 
have any links or information on the town website. Um, and he was even saying, you know, there's a periodic newsletter that goes out if we wanted to have, um, you know, an article or something in that, um, you know, that that would be a good way to get information into the hands of the residents. So, I, you know, I'm not sure <laughs> what we can work on. But, uh, you know, if we throw out some topics, uh, we can certainly work on putting some materials together. At a minimum, let's keep it on the agenda for future meetings so we don't lose sight of uh, that we should do this on an ongoing basis. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, so, yeah, uh, Bob, I'll put you on a thread or we can all be on a thread with uh, Matt and we can try and get that uh, next presentation scheduled. Um, because I do know that uh, as part of the community engagement on the CEC side, I believe, don't quote me on this, um, but we have to get something approved from New York State first, and then all future community engagement efforts are actually qualified, which is a weird nuance, hmm. um, but uh I will take a look back through the notes Carla sent over and uh, we'll get that application process rolling as quick as possible so that uh, all the presentations and the community engagement we are doing, we're at least getting credit for on top of already doing a, a good public service. So, yeah, the only other question I have is uh, we had gotten a proposal from NIPA to do LED street lights in the Con Ed section. And I don't know whatever happened with that. Have you heard anything? Um, I don't remember the, oh, um, in terms of the streetlights qualifying for points, is that the question? No, we had, we, uh, Matt and the team had done, uh, a program for streetlights in the NYSEG part of town and, yeah. uh, NIPA would handle the Con Ed streetlights because the town is roughly 50, 50. And right. I worked with them to get a proposal to the town. And I believe it went through, but I don't know if anybody ever, it wasn't an amazing proposal or anything, but it was a proposal. Uh, it would just be nice to know what the decision was on that, or if it just- uh, put it, I it wouldn't be the person to ask. Yeah, I can I ask. I wouldn't be the person to ask on that, so. Okay. You can also check with, um, with Dave too, for highway um, to see what, what came up with that. Because I believe Matt reached out to, um, for the nice egg side, and there's like a hold up on materials, I believe was the um, outcome of that. So we're still waiting, but for the other side with Con Ed, um, I can check with Dave and Matt too, to see where we are. That'd be great. That'd yeah. be great. Thanks. Thanks, Cara. Sweet. So just uh, one anything? other topic, uh, community choice segregation. Uh, do we know yes. what's happening with that? Uh, I don't know if it has made it onto any work session just yet. Um, I think that's a reminder we need to ping Matt on. Um, yeah, it's I think been, that's it's been well over a month, and uh, it, it hasn't been on a work session. And I, I, I'm, I think we need to get it going. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> fifteen hundred points. It's fifteen hundred. Absolutely. No, absolutely. It's 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 a huge points line item. Um, I also want to appreciate the the amount the town is stretched out. So um, I can imagine with things slipping through on that. Um, but uh, I do agree that we should get it on a work session so that the town can at least receive the documentation um, right. uh, to actually evaluate if a CC actually makes sense here. So. so do you have the ball then, Swan, up to talk to Matt on that? I can I can shoot him an email Great. and we will see how soon it can get on. Um, but I also want to be cognizant of the resources the town may have in terms of yeah, time. Yeah, but but oh. uh, my management experience says if something's important, you should you, you just got to keep after it. And and Matt and the team Absolutely. definitely want to get it done. So we just yeah. have to, yeah, just Absolutely. Keep it I think it's just a matter of time. So I'll keep it top of mind with him. Um, I'll shoot him a reminder on the CCAs. Great. And uh, we'll, we'll just keep on plugging on forward because that'll definitely help us in the push for silver. Yeah, and lots of carbon dioxide. 
more uh, more importantly it's probably the biggest thing we'll do yeah it's a uh, it's a huge impact line item mm -hmm. so cool um other thoughts ideas concerns anything else otherwise uh we can all get back to our evenings and uh I think this was a productive and meaningful call. Thanks very much. Thanks yeah. for organizing it. Thanks for your help, Kyra. No problem. You guys have a great night. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.